Logo, Chafee College, Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art, Home Edition. Text, Artist Talk, Stanton Hunter. April 7, 2021. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for joining us at today's program featuring Stanton Hunter, presented as part of the Wignall Museum's Home Edition, a series of curated artist talks, workshops, and discussions featuring artists and cultural workers. My name is Rebecca Trawick. I'm the director and curator of the Wignall Museum. The Wignall Museum is a teaching museum and interdisciplinary art space that introduces Chafee College students, faculty, staff, and community members to innovative contemporary art objects and ideas. By fostering critical thinking, visual literacy, discourse, and empathy, the museum seeks to enhance the intellectual and cultural life of our community. We wanna take a moment to recognize that we're situated on the Rancho Cucamonga campus of Chafee College, which resides on the traditional and unceded lands of the Tongva people. We offer our recognition and respect to the elders, both past, present, and future. Text, to learn more about native land acknowledgement, please visit usdac.us slash native land or native-land.ca. And hello, my name is Roman Stallenwerk. I'm assistant curator at the Wignall Museum. Please visit us at www.chafee edu slash Wignall to access our full schedule of programs and available recordings. You can follow us on social media, including Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube at Wignall Museum. Subscribe to our email list, www.chafu.edu slash Wignall slash about dash us.php. When possible, recordings are made available on our website. Announcements post to our email subscribers and social media when new videos are available. All recordings on our site include captions and audio descriptions as options. And we also ask that you complete a brief survey after the session at tinyurl.com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Andy Hadel. I am the preparator at the museum. In a moment, we'll have a presentation from Stan Hunter. Afterward, we'll have time available for Q&A. Thanks, Roman and Andy. So today I have the honor of introducing our guest artist, Stanton Hunter. Stanton Hunter is a mid-career artist exhibiting nationally and internationally. Writings both by and about him and images of his work appear in numerous publications, including Craft in America, Ceramics Art and Perception, Ceramics Monthly, Studio Potter, Craft Arts International, and others. Hunter has been an instructor and guest lecturer at the Art Center College of Design in Pasadena. He ran the ceramics program at Scripps College in Claremont for five years. He was visiting art assistant professor of art at Pitzer College in Claremont and is currently professor of art at Chafee College in Rancho Cucamonga. Prior to receiving his MFA in 2000 from the University of Southern California, where he studied with and was a TA for Ken Price, his undergraduate studies were in perceptual psychology, alternative education at Eckerd College in St. Petersburg, Florida. And he pursued a career in music before the visual arts. Hunter's work incorporates vessels, autonomous sculptural forms, and site-specific installations with work in or referring to the landscape. Here at Chafee, we're happy to call him a longtime colleague and happy to have him with us here today. So please join me in welcoming Stan Stanton Hunter to the Zoom stage and in giving him a warm virtual welcome to Home Edition. Welcome, Stan. Stan joins from his ceramics studio. Hi, everybody. My name is Stan Hunter, and I run the ceramics program at Chafee College, um, which if you're taking my class, I hope you know that already. <laughs> um, but for those of you who don't take that class, that's who I am. Um, I wanna thank the Wignall for this opportunity to talk to you. Uh, this is part of the Wignall Museum's uh, home edition series. And I'm gonna be speaking, be speaking to you today about a residency that I went on uh, in the spring, uh, during spring break of 2019. Uh, the residency happened at Mission Clay Sewer Pipe Factory in uh, Phoenix, Arizona for about eight days. And, uh, very interesting time. Uh, artist residencies are a very popular thing for artists to do. It's a really awesome activity. It's, um, it's like a retreat where you are allowed to go. Uh, oftentimes it's funded um, by the residency or by um, uh, corporations uh, uh, will fund it. 
um, where you go and spend a week, two weeks, a month, a year making art. And it's uh, your, your sort of, your obligations to the outside world are cut to a minimum. You're just making art. And uh, so it's a really good time to do a deep dive. It's a little bit like graduate school, which is sort of a deep dive as well. Um, but it's, um, it's uh, a way to really kind of connect to what means most to you and what you most want to make. Uh, normally with residencies, you go there with art that you want to make. You have an idea or you have a body of work that you're exploring. Um, and for most of these residencies, they're in very beautiful, rural, uh, sort of rustic conditions out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and it's places where you can walk and your mind can just be clear and free of city, of home, of all, everything, of distraction. So you can really devote yourself to your practice. That's one kind of residency. Then there are other residencies, most often connected with the material. For instance, clay or glass or metal or rubber and plastic. Um, and in these residencies, you'll actually work in the factory. Uh, one of the more famous clay residencies in the United States is in the world actually, is the uh, Kohler residency in Wisconsin, which is at a toilet manufacturing plant. Um, Kohler toilet, toilets, you see them everywhere, porcelain. And so people will go there and make work using that porcelain and oftentimes they'll actually make work riffing on toilets, actually. They'll actually use toilet fixtures as part of the work. Um, so my, my residency uh, was at the Mission Clay Sewer Pipe in Phoenix, which I will show you in just a second. Um, I did wanna show you some pictures of other residencies just to give you an idea of, of sort of the broad range that there is available. So I'm gonna share screen now. Uh, let me get this up first. A photograph of the Mission Clay factory complex from above, with autumn-colored trees surrounding the buildings, and arid mountains in the distance. One of the things I, I kind of just mentioned in passing is that you go there with your own ideas of what you'd like to make. Um, that's especially true when you go to these places out in the middle of nowhere, where you used to have your body of work. Um, and that's interesting. And I went to my residency in Phoenix with that in mind. I, I had ideas going in. Um, but what happens in the manufacturing environment is that it starts to play on you. And all of a sudden your work starts relating to the interface of manufacturing and art, creativity and industry. And so it's a whole different kind of thing where it's not necessarily just your own body of work, but it's sort of in relation to something else. And um, I've always loved site specific work, which is work in and relating to an environment where the environment changes the work or your work changes the environment or at least they talk to each other, they relate. So they're sort of like, instead of this object on a pedestal that has its own thing, it doesn't relate to a background. It's shown in a white cube, a gallery, which, which doesn't have, supposedly doesn't have historical reference. It's just its own thing. Um, Site-specific work actually is more where it relates to the environment. It might be an installation where you walk through the artwork. Um, the environment might, environment might act upon and change the work. Um, so it's a, it's a whole big broader thing uh, than just the object itself. So anyway, as I said, I went into uh, the Mission Clay with an idea of, uh, with some ideas to make, but then it started playing on me. But anyway, let me show you some other residencies just to give you an idea. A farm-like campus nestled among trees and rolling green hills from above. Um, this, I believe, might be Scowegan in uh, Maine, the painting and sculpture residency, very famous one. A group of people stand under a ranch entry gate on a winter day at dusk. This is Anderson Ranch in Colorado, a very, very beautiful place. A pair of contemporary style studio buildings with wood shingles hiding and a large deck between them, along with a view of a cove above the surrounding evergreen trees. Um, this is Haystack, a residency in Maine, a very famous clay residency. I think they, they, they're uh, using other craft materials now as well besides clay but there's just dedicated out in the middle of nowhere to your own art practice. Text, Mission Clay Residency, March 15th to 23rd, 2019. And then there's Mission Clay Sewer Pipe Residency that I went to. Um, if this was funded by Mission Clay. Uh, the the uh, head of Mission Clay is Brian Van Sal. He also runs Laguna Clay Company here in California. Um, I should say Mission Sewer Pipe is a huge manufacturing plant. 
They used to have three of them in California. They still have one in uh, Corona del Mar. Um, now they, and they also have one in Phoenix, uh, but those are the two, only two remaining plants. But these company, this company made all the sewer pipes underneath all of Los Angeles and underneath all of San Francisco, San Diego, and I also believe Portland and Phoenix. So we're talking hundreds, if not thousands of miles of sewer pipe. So they can give you the scale, just the sort of the vastness of, <clears throat> of this kind of manufacturing. So anyway, I went to the one in Phoenix. Um, they put me up in a, a hotel, motel, sorry, right on the freeway, right off the 10 freeway in the industrial area of Phoenix. An image of a modest hotel room with a kitchenette. It's very uh, simple and clean, and um, I, I enjoyed it actually. Uh, the walls were extremely thin, so there was a lot of bumping in walls and uh, uh, being woken at all times of night. So it didn't sleep great, but um, but it was you know it was nice. It it worked. It worked, and it was very close to the factory, so it kind of kept me in the milieu of the industry and the industrial area uh, the, of manufacturing. <clears throat> it kept my head in it, which was very interesting uh, how it played on me and then my dreams, which I hope becomes evident in this. Uh, slide presentation. A rural intersection with a tire warehouse on the corner. This is driving to the factory. A banner on a billboard style sign reads, building product company, with a driveway flanked by wrought iron fencing below. And it's called Mission Clay, but all it says in the sign is building products company. You go down this long, long driveway, about a half mile long, and you end up at Mission Sewer Pipe. A parking lot in front of stacks of pipes. And there's a whole stack of sewers. It really became kind of like a Mad Max landscape to me, which sort of played on me. It had its own kind of special beauty that I, sort of an austere beauty of, well, you'll see, of these mountains of clay, of local clays and feldspars and uh, pulverized fired pipe that had broken, just mountains of these things that they use as materials to make their pipes out of. Metal scraps next to piles of various earthen materials. So it had this its own sort of uh, austere landscape that was really started to become quite beautiful to me. These are some of the mounds of, of uh, clay and dirt that, and here's shards of pipes that have been broken up that they use in their clay body. Rounded pebbles. That's the landscape. That's what you walk on. It's just all, all clay. Industrial towers illuminated by a golden setting sun. That's the next door neighbors. Longhorns on a hood inside a warehouse with sunlight shining on them from a distant window. And uh, Don Wrights, who's a rather famous ceramist, now deceased, he left this golf cart there with, a, with the horns. So I, got to, I got many rides in it, and I even got to drive it, which is quite, quite special. Very big, uh, sort of a big, big complex, so the, the golf cart came in very handy. A solitary small cloud in a glowing orange sky above the warehouse roof. And uh, the, the weather in Phoenix is... Uh, very dramatic. So here's a very dramatic picture of a, a cloud. I think it might have been the only one that showed up. Maybe not. I think there's another some other clouds and other pictures, but uh, <laughs> they don't have a lot of clouds down there. Piles of gravel, sand, and clay. Here's the landscape again. These these mounds appear and disappear daily. So it's a very movable landscape and quite beautiful, I think. Rows of low-hanging clouds over more mounds. The pipes themselves. Just row upon row of different size pipes. Images of the rows. Here's some more. Rows and rows, endless rows. A narrow gap between stacked clay pipes. It's almost like a library. Two building-sized round kilns with a layer of pipes laying on the ground outside. The kilns in the factory. The kilns are huge. This reminds me of the big top tent at Burning Man a little bit. These are about two stories tall. Just huge kilns. And these are for the large pipes. Their firings take anywhere from a month to two months to fire. And that's after the kilns or after the pipes have been drying out for a long time. And they have these enormous wet rooms where they have water underneath the floor just to keep them wetter longer so they don't crack. And then these really huge long firings. A man wearing a hard hat stands inside one of the kilns. That's Hans Miles. I'll introduce him in another picture. Uh, he's the resident tech of. Uh, both the residency and of Mission Clay. He designs their clay body, um, does all sorts of tests for them. Young guy out of uh, Arizona State University. 
a group of pipes standing vertically on a bed of fire bricks. This is the one of the car kilns. And they, this car kiln is about 100 feet long, maybe a little bit longer. And um, these are getting rolled in. It's like on a train track getting rolled into the kiln. I have a picture or a movie right here I can play you. So he's inspecting the pipes as they go into the kiln. A worker shines a flashlight as he inspects the car of pipes slowly rolling by. A few remaining pipes on large bricks with six rectangular holes in each. And here's on one of the beds of the, there are, these pipes are getting unloaded, I believe. And, uh, but this is the, this is sort of the rail cart, the cart that the um, pipes are stacked on to be taken into the kiln. Various images of the carts. So it's quite enormous. They've got about three or four of these carts that they have lined up to, um, to fire. And here's one all packed up, ready to go into the kiln. And there's the kiln itself. Bars and wires above an opening in a roof. This is the uh, the ceiling of much of the of the plant. <laughs> um, it's quite dynamic, you know, indoor and outdoor sort of blend together. There are a couple feral dogs that are, you know, that eat there and just roam around the the factory. Uh, birds nest inside. Wind whips around in there, and clay dust just plumes of clay dust. It's a really sort of a dramatic, like I said, Mad Max type environment that I really played on my on me and became it became beautiful a worker looks up at a towering machine with a conveyor belt leading up to it here's the clay mixing area where they take all those mountains of dirt and they go out these conveyor belts and go through sifters and then they combine them a series of conveyors from above um, it's quite a huge operation text mission clay factory and residency tech a picture of a mustached man grinning in front of carved and glazed pipes there's Hans. Um, he's he's a really smart guy, and he can do just about anything. So it's really great to have him as a as a help, um, a very big help. You can see with some of the work in the back. I'll show you more artist work, but a lot most time people come in and decorate the outsides of the pipes. Text sampling of past residency art. A photograph of four glazed and fired pipes standing vertically in the sun. Two of them with black and white patterns. The other two with bright colors. Here we go. And, you know, I should know the name of some of these artists, and I've forgotten them. Um, but anyway, like I say, they come in and they decorate the outsides of the pipes. A pipe with geometric black and white designs. And they're quite attractive. So they keep the pipes remain pipes. A pale yellow pipe with a carved circular pattern. A set of three pipes with large pastel ovals on the fronts. A pipe with a Picasso-style woman's profile. A pipe with ribbons of opposing diagonal black and white lines. A horizontal pipe with lines in various shades of blue. This one I do know. This is Jun Kaneko. He's an artist out of uh, Nebraska. A very famous artist who he does huge work. And he actually glazed the pipes and fired them. A pipe with the images of two faces in shades of gray. A lot of people carve on them. This is graffito. Text. My work. One. Sets of cylinders slash pipes with handles, a set with polka dots and a set without. So I'm getting, getting to my work now. And again, these are ideas that I had before I went down uh, for artworks to do with the pipes. Um, the first one was, um, I, I used the, the, the pipes as a, I've been, I've been obsessing about mugs, coffee mugs. And especially I've been obsessing about handles on mugs and the look of them. Um, I've been you know, taking pictures of handles and making handles and trying to get the perfect handle and the way that the handle joins the, the mug. It has to, I want it to have a nice solid uh, uh, joint and the look of it flowing out of that. Anyway, so I, I, just, I thought it'd be funny to put a set of handles on a set of uh, sewer pipes. So they became like bottomless mugs. An unglazed pipe with an orange handle. I had solid ones and I had polka dotted ones. So I did one set of solid mugs and one set of polka dotted mugs and they're bottomless, <laughs> bottomless cups. Various images of all four bottomless cup pieces. So anyway, these are about two feet tall, very heavy. They're like a couple hundred pounds uh, each. So anyway, but I thought it'd be funny to have a set of sewer pipes with handles on them, decorative handles. Text, displacement. A picture of a pipe cut length and widthwise, with frosted acrylic sheets between the pieces. Another idea I had before going down was um, displacement. I had Hans uh, cut up one of the uh, pipes into uh, four pieces. 
And then I, I bought plexiglass at different thicknesses to stick in between these things to displace the, so I'd put the pipe back together again, but it'd be offset because of the different thicknesses of plexiglass. So here I am gluing the plexiglass to the pipes and then put it together. And then I started buying hardware for this as well. A structure made of metal rods, nuts, and wire screwed into plexiglass. It kind of gave sort of an industrial look and also like almost like ship building, like ship sails and stuff like that. And, and the, the hardware is almost like, it's a sort of refined hardware you'd find like on fishing tackles or on for bait. Um, Pictures of the piece from various angles. So anyway, this is all about this placement. And then I added my architectural elements that I've been, I had been making for other things. And I added it onto here. So it's sort of an architectural piece, a, a design, uh, design piece. Um, and I finished it. Images of gray three-dimensional geometric shapes inside a plexiglass quadrant. I like that view of it. So you can really see how things are kind of displaced and offset and, and stuff. Text, untitled, geode. Another idea I had was to, to make a geode of, out of uh, one of the half pipes. Um, this is uh, Hans cutting one of the pipes in half to use as a mold to set the other half pipe in so it wouldn't fall apart. And um, uh, he sent me a whole, uh, uh, about um, 40 pounds of the clay that they use for the sewer pipes. And I did press molds of these different geomet uh, geometric, mostly triangular uh, based uh, geometric forms that I was gonna, uh, you know, score and slip into the side of the pipe. You'll see in a second here. The red, green, and blue glazed shapes drying on a palette. And when I got there, I painted them with underglazes, and then I laid them in the pipe in this sort of this open geode type of thing, arrangement. Images of the triangles clustered together inside the half pipe. Uh, one of the ideas was that people have been decorating the outsides of the pipe, so I thought, well, why not decorate the insides of the pipes? Text, butterfly migration grids is seen in a sewer pipe. Um, I used to do a, a body of work. I still do it from time to time of butterfly migration grids. Scientists uh, f discovered back in 2006 that monarch butterflies migrate from the Sierra Madre Mountains of Mexico. Actually, they, they migrate from the Midwest down to the Sierra Madre Mountains in Mexico and back. It takes five generations of butterflies to do one full migration loop, which is pretty crazy if you think about it. And the way they find their way is they discovered that they see invisible to us grids of UV light in the sky and they follow those grids and that's how they get to Mexico. I think there's a numerous uh, insects that see these grids in the sky, but I, I was fascinated that you know there's a, a species on earth that lives on the same planet, but according to different, totally different rules and really live in a different world. Um, so I made grids as if we could see them. So that was a whole body of work that I did for a, a number of years actually. And um, I decided to put grids, they're sky forms. So I thought it'd be kind of fun and interesting to put them inside of the sewer pipe, which of course goes underground. And I made it so they could view them and I'll, and I'll show you in a second. So we cut a, a pipe in half and I uh, set the grids inside, different kinds of grids that I had been making. Three three-dimensional grids inside a half pipe, one comprised of cube-shaped lines, one with a solid cube structure, and one with triangular lines. These are being set in place. Narrow square-shaped metal pipes and a floor. Um, it turned out that I had these peepholes, like using a door to look through. And so I had peepholes drilled into the pipe. And it turned out that the pipe was not wide enough to be able to get a good view of the grids. So I had to add spacers. I added these metal spacers into the side. I had to glue them in. And um, I had to sand off the rust off them. And what was really cool is sort of the dust, the iron dust shadows that they left. I thought that was pretty interesting. It's sort of a, uh, uh, what, a kind of a, 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 what would be the word? I'm not thinking of it, but a, a record of what happened there. It's sort of like a, that shadow. Images of the grids inside the half pipe from various angles. So here we are. Um, I think I actually glued, there's the metal glued in, and then we placed the top. That's the top with the peep holes in there. I have them covered in tapes so they don't get dust on them. Uh, and there, there's the piece. The pipe is a hole with the halves tied together on a wood stand with a lamp shining inside. I lit them, and then you can look at the peep holes down into the, uh, the grids. A man wearing a hard hat looks inside. So I kind of like this idea, these huge, really heavy pipe and this big, you know, it's really a big pipe to be able to see these really intimate little, little uh, grid um, 
environments inside the pipe. Text, 5, as above, so below, vessels in vessels, and 5, photo project I didn't realize was happening till I returned home. Now we're starting to get to where the place is playing on me, and I, I didn't realize I had a photo project, like I say here, till I, till I returned home. Um, so I had a photo project going on sort of unconsciously, and then the vessels started playing on me because, you know, vessels, the normal pottery is a vessel. It, it's a container. Um, we use it for coffee, for cereal, for storing things. And then the sewer pipes are vessels also, but they are vessels like blood vessels. They're used for transport. So it was a vessels and vessels. Um, and so I came up with that idea down there. 26 bowls and vases of various shapes and sizes drying. Um, Hans and I, he had two wheels there. So Hans and I sat down for a couple hours using the, the sewer clay, pipe clay body. And we threw a bunch of rather large bowls and vases. So here they all are. Multiple views of the bulls and vases. We had, we had a lot of fun that day, as you can see. <laughs> Stan and Hans grin in a selfie. A couple hobbits looking at our pots. The various vases and bowls inside the ends of pipes stacked outside. And then we put the pots inside the vessels, one of the stacks, and, um, and, and I start taking pictures. So it's vessels and vessels as above, like containers on earth, and so below which is below the earth. That's, that uh, phrase, as above, so below, comes, I believe, from hermetic philosophy. And then I photoshopped a whole bunch together, so it just took on this more you know, re repetitive uh, nature. A group of vases with white underglaze on the top halves and simple shapes in various colors hand equals brushed on the sides. When we were done with this photo project, because it really exists only as a photo or photos, um, Hans glazed all these and then fired them there and he gave them to all the workers there, which I thought was really a wonderful thing. So this almost became like a social practice, practice in a way, because the, all these workers in the there, you know, there are these tough, you know, factory workers working with a very heavy, unforgiving material. And uh, here they have artists come in making stuff, and they're very curious. They come around and see what's going on. They help out a lot. And uh, so Hans uh, fired these up and then gave them to the workers, which I thought was a really wonderful gesture. And here's the uh, inter in inadvertent photo project, dreams and language. So this is where it becomes really kind of interesting to me and very poetic. A picture of light reflecting inside stacked pipes. So I was taking these pictures and this woman is just crazy. It looked like, you know, like the Starship Enterprise when it goes in the warp speed, is like that. It kind of looks like that or it looks like looking into a chrome uh, tail tailpipe stuff, you know, racing cars or something. It has this kind of, feeling of motion. And then the be able, to be able to look through the pipe at other pipes, you get these sort of, they became like viewing uh, portals into other realms of pipe. Other pipe ends from inside a pipe. And so they became viewing devices, almost like telescopes or, or microscopes. So you got these great views. An image taken from an angle in which staggered pipe ends appear to form overlapping circles. That's pretty stunning, I think. These great views of other, of other pipes. It's almost fractal. A picture of a woman holding out her hand, a tattooed hand. Ah, uh, so that particular semester, I went during spring break of, uh, of uh, spring semester 2019. I had a student in that class, really talented. And she showed up um, very early on in the semester with this henna tattoo in her hands. It just blew me away. It looked like, I, I looked at her hand and, went, and it kind of felt like I was being slipped into dream time or something. It just felt like shamanic somehow. I took a picture, but it's pretty spectacular, her, her tattoo. The reason why I have a picture of her hand in here is that one evening while there, probably about the fifth, sixth day, I had a dream of one of the ends of the pipe, and this student with her henna tattoos put a uh, medicine pouch at around two o'clock on one of the ends of the pipe. And all of a sudden, when I woke up, or even in the dream, I remembered the movie um, Arrival. I don't know if you saw that movie. The movie poster, which depicts nine smoke circles with branch-like points above shadowy figures. But this is what it looked like exactly with this medicine pouch here. And this is actually the heptapods, the aliens, had this language that was, that was uh, uh, communicated in circles, these smoke circles. Um, and they, could, they said different words, but it, um, I have a whole thing here. What's so cool about that movie and about the language is that it's actually based on solid linguistic theory. 
they, they cite the wharf Sapir hypothesis, which is how you see is determined by the language that you speak and use. Um, so anyway, it's sort of the movie's based off this about perception. Orthography, this is from the movie, is a set of rules about the way language is written, including spelling and pronunciation or punctuation. The alien language of the heptapods is nonlinear, written in circular puffs of smoke with no beginning or end. Information at the end of the sentence is known at the beginning because they both exist at the same time. So anyway, I was sort of tripping on this, these as being, you know, these circles as being language and then the medicine pouch at two. And then, and then the light was coming out in circles at me. Sun glare and rings at the end of a covered walkway. And so everything was becoming circular and talking in circles. And um, the whole thing became kind of like language. Um, so anyway, it hit me very poetically, both visually, the, the stacks and the circles and the repetition. And then in this case, the concentric circles. Uh, my son gave me this <laughs> t-shirt. You may have remembered Trump's made up word, kofif. Anyway, this is in, this is kofif in heptapod, in heptapod language. One of my favorite t-shirts. Le petit pipe, pipe. This is referencing the little prince. Um, the little prince, if you haven't read the book, please do read it. Very poetic, very beautiful, very moving. And in one part of the book, there is, um, he, he grows a rose and the rose is protected and it's very vain until it sees a whole rose bush with hundreds of roses and just thinks, oh, I'm not special. I'm just one of them, you know, of many thousands. And the little prince assures her, no, no, you're, you're special because I grew you and I took care of you. So you're special to me. And, and um, so anyways, thinking about these pipes um, and they make, when they're cranking out the pipes and so they're not drying, but when they're actually making them, that factory can, ch can churn out, they can crank out a thousand pipes a day. So I wanna show you a couple of movies of them making these pipes. They extrude them, meaning it's like it's an adult Play-Doh factory where they squirt these things out of, of machines. A blue metal beam retracts from an enclosed cylinder, pulling an extruded pipe out with it, which then rolls away on a conveyor. So those are the small pipes. And then here are the large pipes being extruded. A pipe is extruded up vertically from the base of a machine. A pair of blades then spin across the top before a worker steps in and lifts them. These things weigh an enormous amount of weight. Very heavy. Compact clay. The clay goes up these shoots and into these other shoots when it gets mixed all together and then squirted out of these extruders, very, very highly compressed. A pipe resting on a hydraulic lift slowly lowers as the worker inspects the pipe behind it. The worker lowers a claw which places a rim around the pipe. He peers inside. As the worker steps away, mechanical arms flips the pipe onto its other end. The mechanical arms release one pipe, then wrap around the other and pull it off the hydraulic lift. that all day call me call me nuts but it's pretty, it's pretty cool a thick clay ring so anyway they make like i say they can make about a thousand of those a day so i thought it would be kind of um what would be the word uh, pathetic or or something 
pathetic, poetic, just to make my own sewer pipes. I made my own um, custom sewer pipe and I use coils. Three coil layers atop a wide ring. I am working on it. Here's a movie of me uh, working on it. Stan needs a ball of clay on a folding tabletop. He squeezes the clay into a cylindrical shape. I like the whole idea of making something by hand, too. Yeah, that's nice. That's a cameraman. Stan rolls the clay out into a rope with his palms. <laughs> he tears off half and continues rolling out one of the pieces from the middle outward. He grabs the other piece and rolls it out. Cameraman and commentation. Commentator. <laughs> commentator. Thank you. <laughs> On smiles. Yes, yeah, sir. Resident tech god of mission. Stan carries one of the pieces over to his in progress pipe and coils it around the top. He walks off for the other piece and adds that as well. He touches his chest and bows. Hans gives a thumbs up. So anyway, here I am hand building one of these while they're you know, extruding a thousand of them in the other room. A picture of Stan holding an 18 inch pipe while standing next to his own, which is almost as tall as he is. And there it is pretty much completed. I, uh, I had, that's the one I use as a model to make the top. <laughs> it's pretty fun. It's, it's life size. And then they have a stamp they put on there. I have another slide that they put on all the pipes. Um, the stamp reads, Building Products Company Phoenix. There it is. And it has the date and the uh, batch number and all that sort of stuff there. A picture of Stan's various pieces inside a concrete studio space. And then the studio. That's a bigger, broader view of all the projects going on at one time. That's Hans' sculpture in the, in the background there. It's quite, quite spectacular. Um, anyway, uh, and then uh, I went to dinner with uh, Susan Beiner, um, again, professor at Arizona State University. Hans studied with her. She used to be out of Cal State San Bernardino, actually. A group photo. And then Hans and his, his girlfriend, Susan, and her husband. We had a dinner and parting shot. A narrow aisle between stacks of pipes. And there you go. And that was my residency. I hope you enjoyed the journey. Alrighty. Well, thank you for watching. And um, I understand there might be some some questions that, which I'd be very happy to field. And uh, fire away. Rebecca. Thank you, Stan. What a beautiful introduction to your experience at Mission Clay, and also a great introduction to artist residencies. So, um, yeah, we'd love to open it up to questions or comments. I'll see if I feel comfortable answering them. Yeah, right. <laughs> Participant video feeds appear. Hi, Stan. I wanted to ask you about the application process for the residency and um, what your uh, research went into the application and if you have any tips for students who are applying to residencies. <laughs> uh, uh, very good question. And yes, applications are usually what you do. Um, what I did was I uh, had the good fortune of um, having my work included in a couple of group shows over at Amoca, and Brian Vanzal, who is the head of Laguna Clay and Mission Clay, he happened to be there and we just got to know each other and, and he liked my architectural things and he thought it'd be really cool for me to start playing with the inside of pipes. So it was just a kind of a, there was no application. I was invited and it was very organic and I was really lucky. And that's how that worked. Um, and uh, with my uh, application for Vermont Studio Center, um, that's an unusual residency because they, um, they do it on sort of merit. So you can go there and you can do nothing for a month or you can make something or you can do something totally different, write or, you know, move, I don't know, whatever you want to do. And it's just that it's sort of like a, a reward to um, most people do make art. Um, that 
the, uh, a resume and, and images and artist statement. Um, and you didn't have to say what you wanted to do on the residency. Often they, they want a proposal. So you want to get a, a really good proposal. Um, I'm glad that I didn't have to do a proposal for Mission Clay because that left it open for me to, to come up with stuff while I was there. I, you know, three or four of those projects came up to me, came to me while I was there. So um, that was kind of cool. I was impressed with all the different things you did, the directions you took, took the, the residency experience. And I, I really appreciated that. So I'm glad you had that freedom. Um, I'm wondering, uh, well, I have one comment and that is that I was struck at how Minoan your, uh, the pipe you made in particular looks. <laughs> you know, it looked, it looked like it was smaller at the base and approximately the, that ratio of Minoan columns, you know, and also a little bit of what, Egypt in there <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> Um, so um, that was kind of interesting, but, um, but I was curious about how you decided on the scale of the handles that you put on the, the pipe mugs. Um, well, I'll, I'll comment first about the, about the Minoan. I, when I actually sort of thought about making the pipe, I had no idea what it's going to look like. I thought it was going to be really lumpy and funny looking. And I was going to paint it red and just sort of this like really crude sort of Beavis and Butthead type of pipe. But then, as I start as I started building it, it sort of got more and more kind of tight and kind of looking like a pipe, and I sort of went with that. But it did it did go. I think, <laughs> I think when I dried, I think it kind of took a right hand turn too. So it's definitely a custom sewer pipe for your house. Um, <laughs> you probably want it above ground. But I'll anyway, put it in my garden. <laughs> everybody needs a sewer pipe in their garden. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, so that was sort of. Uh, in a way, unfocused. I wasn't sure what I was going for. I just went ahead and, and did it, but uh, it came out, as you said, like that. Um, the second uh, question, what was the, this, the, again, the topic of your, your question? Oh, the handles. Yeah, um, handles, yeah. Well, I've been, they're mug handles. And I've been just, I, I went to NSICA, the National Clay Conference um, that year and the year before, and I took pictures. I mean, I just have like about, you know, 50 pictures of mug handles. And I talked to people about mug handles about how to do certain things. I've been really looking at them and you know how they you know how they join and the, the joint and um, the flow of them and, and so I, they were all this hand this in this scale. Yeah. So I was making handles. I, I I like larger handles too, but I said, you know what? I'm just gonna make mug handles for these <laughs> these things. I probably should have put them on six foot the big pipes, like six foot tall ones, just to really <laughs> But, you know, they were those. Those were like about two thousand pounds each. So I, <laughs> I thought I'd go with a two hundred pounder instead. Um, but yeah, it, I, it was just the scale. Then I thought that the again in my mind the juxtaposition of of intimate handheld light something you drink coffee out of um, to put on one of these monster things. Um, yeah. So I was really trying to play with. It was a kind of a visual joke and playing with scale. And okay, thanks. Thank yeah, you. Thanks. Good to see you, Jan. You too. I'll go next. I was just wondering, hi, Stan. Hey, great how are you? It's so fun. Yeah. It looks like you just had a blast. That was great. <laughs> um, I was just wondering what was the most, maybe some of the most surprising things that happened while you were there? Because it seemed transformative in a it way. Was. It was, I yeah. Um, well, I, I think, um, you know, it was a bit of a, a shock to, to go stay in the, the motel there off the 10 freeway. I mean, I, instead of having, you know, bucolic, you know, the, the, the lake and the trees and, you know, I had, um, I had a boarded up Carl's Jr. And, um, you know, out the front door and, and uh, there was definitely some drug deals happening in the front. And I mean, it's kind of like a- Waves hands and grimaces. You know, I, I was a little concerned at first and then to, to actually start feeling like it was home was, was very, it was cool. And, um, you know, uh, th that transition into it sort of feeling like home, you know, with the bail bond place and that sold pit bull dogs and stuff. It was just like another, it, it was wonderful. I mean, I really kind of, um, just for that to start feeling like home was really interesting. And, and that I could start dreaming about this stuff was really interesting. Although it was hard to, because I, like I said, I was getting woken up a lot 
in the evening. There were, there were some rooms with, you know, eight people. And I mean, it's, I don't know what that's all about. It felt somewhere between a residential motel and, and, a, and a regular motel where people stay for longer periods of time. Um, so that, and then, the, and then the, the facility itself, like I said, sort of a Mad Max thing, I really got into it. It's sort of like my, everything got covered in clay dust and there's just plumes of clay dust and the, and the feral dogs. And, um, um, you know, it played on me in a way that, you know, really, you know, other residencies wouldn't play on me. So, um, and I never fought it. If uh, I mean, I never said, "Oh, I'd rather be at, I'd rather be in Vermont or something like that." Um, I think what also was sort of transformational was I had that dream about the end of the pipe and it becoming like language. That was really, that was really like, "Oh my goodness, this is really um, speaking to me." Because this this thing with the, the with the wharf sophia hypothesis that how it's based on Hopi language. And Hopi language, um, the, uh, Benjamin Lee Wharf studied Hopi language and found that they don't have, they don't put containers on containerless things. Like there's no word for river because it's always different. Um, there's no, there's summer's not a time like three months of the year. Summer's when it gets hot. So summer can be in the winter if it gets hot. Um, so it's just a far more experiential language. And our language, you know, we have subject and object, we have nouns that makes everything kind of solid and stop moving. You know, things are static and things experientially are not static at all. So, um, so this whole thing with language and how it makes us perceive it really kind of, which has been a topic that's sort of near and dear to me for a long time. Um, um, all of a sudden it came to bear on this, this um, factory setting. So that was really kind of, yeah, I hope that answers your question. It just became, like I say, really, really poetic and, and find poetry in places you don't think you're going to find it. Just on a side note, with the, the pipes that are painted on, what do they do with those? Do they actually put those into the ground or are they sold oh, no. off for like artwork or? <laughs> um, they, I, they don't have it quite organized yet. Hans runs that too. He has a, a sort of an outdoor gallery area where all those pipes are just there on display. Um, uh, there was rumor that one of my pipes was going to go into a show somewhere. I don't know if that ever happened. Um, so I think they farmed the work out to different shows when, when asked for it. But it's probably a little prohibitive since they're so heavy. Um, anyway, so yeah, they, they don't go underground. They stay above ground and there's an exhibition place. Um, I imagine some of them will, be, will stay inside in that huge room that was a studio like there are other, other ones. So anyway, it's sort of a mystery. I'm who knows? Maybe after I maybe after I I'm long gone, then something will happen cool with them. <laughs> Just wanted to know when you are doing a residency, is there only one artist at a time? Yeah, this one's a solo residency. Solo residency. That's yeah. what I was. And how, you decide how long the period of yourself or yes. the day. Yeah. Well, we both we I, I talked with um, Brian about that. Um, but yes, that's a really good point. A lot of artist residencies have many artists there. So you can rub shoulders and there's sort of a cross pollination of ideas that way, which is very cool. This one is just sort of, it's a whole, it's this whole other thing, you know, it's actually very contemplative, even though it was at a factory. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good to know that. I'm not sure about it. I've never been to Kohler. I think that, do they have, does anyone know if they have that one at a time or if it's? No, they have a few people at a time. Sometimes okay. they have, you know, two, sometimes they have a three. I think that's what I heard from the people when they. Yeah. And it's also kind of sometimes really long period of time. People go there six months, three months. Yeah. yeah. There are, with this residency, there are people that do return. Um, and Brian said something about that. Maybe kind of cool to have me, have me down there again, which I, I would love to do. I, I have no idea what I do as yeah. the next next thing. But. That's the best part. They don't know what you're going to do next. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah very, very true. Yeah. Good to see you, I see. Good to see you, Stan. Yeah. How long were you there? It was about eight days, eight, nine days. Oh, my gosh. I thought it was longer. You did a lot. Oh yeah, no. I started in more. I started in morning and, and went. Holy oh, cow! Yeah. Well, and and uh, um, do people actually stop in to see that work? 
you know, the work that has been produced and Hans can let them wander a little or? Yes, they had, they um, actually, after I left, there was a busload of people that came in to, to look at it. I'm not sure exactly where they were from. Um, people, the uh, Arizona State University has a ceramics research division uh, and, and huge collect, a very huge collection. It's a very famous collection. Peter Held used to be, used to run it. And then Garth Johnson, who's now with Everson Museum, used to, to run that. Um, and so I'm not sure if Peter's been there to see it or not, um, but the people come by, it's sort of, it's sort of connected with ASU. So there's a, there's a, a back and forth with that. Yeah, good, I'm glad. I think people should see it. Um, yeah. And and how about your photos? Have you have you shown them? They're beautiful. Oh, thank you. No, I haven't. I, I, I haven't submitted them to show as as a photo exhibit or anything like that. I did the the one where I did the Photoshop of the where it's sort of like wallpaper of the vessels and vessels. Uh -huh. um, I sent a, a large poster of that to the um, the office over at the pipe place, and also to Brian here in, at Laguna Clay. And that's as far as that's gone. Stan, can I ask, has the residency had any lasting effects on your studio practice that you've recognized? Well, yes, because of that way of working. And it, it almost like forced me to, uh, it was such a clear example of something playing on me and just starting to speak to me as opposed to me forcing, you know, this is my body of work and this is what I'm about and this is what I do. It really became, I became like a site specific work, if that makes sense. The, it was kind of, kind of like, um, I don't know, I hate to be new agey, but a little bit channeled. Um, so yeah, that's really played on me. Um, in terms of my art practice, you know, that with COVID and, and having to learn how to go online, which has not been easy for an old person like me, um, my practice is kind of um, I'm waiting. I'm waiting for I'm, wait, I'm waiting for COVID to be over, so I I can't I can't honestly my practice is sort of uh, stalled out right now. But when I go back, if I go back, and how I go back, it'll be very much informed by this way of working. Um, I think it's a lot different. We know we're trained to find our own voice in art training, and this is kind of this is different. Andy Heidel. I was wondering if you could maybe speak uh, a little bit about the value of, you know, community and networking within the clay world, or maybe just broader in, in contemporary art in general. And if, if going to this residency or seeking out these residencies are really um, how that benefits people in this stage of their career. Oh, it's, it's, um, I, I think, um, yeah, having shared experiences with other artists, uh, is huge. I mean, they, they always talk about networking. You know, you have to have work and good work and, and good pictures and, you know, uh, be able to speak in a way about your work that deepens other people's appreciation. All that stuff, yes, that's, you get that in school. But, but what really opens the doors, I think, are the con <clears throat> connections. Um, even during, this, maybe I should say, especially during COVID, um, I wasn't going to do NSICA, the National Clay Conference. It's all online this year. And the last minute, I said, you know what? I need the stimulation. I need other people. And so I went ahead and signed up, and I'm, I'm glad I did. Um, so, but, but anyway, yeah, people, um, this one was, like I say, it was very solo, so I didn't really kind of like network um, at all, um, other than with Hans, and, uh, and that's about it. Um, but, but yeah, knowing people and talking to them is really important. I've, I've, got, I've lectured at other universities because of friends that I know in the uh, clay community, uh, colleagues. So yeah, it's really important um, for showing, for teaching, um, for everything. Yeah, that's, that's great. Yeah, that's a great, great question and a very good thing to think about. Thanks, Dan. Um, huge thanks to you for your generosity today. What a treat to spend time with you. And huge thanks to all of you who joined us today. Please take care. And we'll see you next time. Thank you again, everybody for showing up. It's fun to talk to you. Text, we ask that you complete a quick online survey that will help us as we evaluate our online programming and plan our future programs. tinyurl.com slash Wignall Spring 21 Visitor Survey. Logo, 
Chafee College, Wignall Museum of Contemporary Art, Home Edition.